Hello, I'm Donald McCauley and welcome to this BMJ Leader Conversation. Today I'm talking to Rachel Moses. Rachel, tell me about your current role and how you got there. My name is Rachel and my pronouns are she, her, and I am a physiotherapist by background. So I studied at the University of Hertfordshire and qualified, I think in 2000, 2001. Um, and I currently work in a portfolio role. So I work as a consultant respiratory physiotherapist. I work as a national clinical advisor for respiratory um, for NHS England, and I work as head of clinical leadership development for what was the NHS Leadership Academy, now part of NHS England. Now, you have a whole lot of things that I'd like to ask you about. And the first thing is about the Leadership Academy. How does that work? So it's we are in a state of transition. So um, the NHS Leadership Academy was formed um, over 10 years ago and it was really a centre of excellence for leadership. And over the past um, two, three years, it's been it's, it's had a number of, of families, a number of parents, if you like. But now it's part of NHS England and NHS England are going through a big restructure at the moment. And the NHS Leadership Academy will essentially be incorporated into the new model of NHS England. So it's really just a space where we bring together a variety of people with a variety of different backgrounds who have skills and experience in leadership. It may be leadership design of programmes, um, leadership strategies, it may be research um, people to really help try and embed inclusive leadership values across health and care. So for someone listening to this who's interested in becoming a leader, how do you join the Leadership Academy? What, what, what is the structure and organisation? So the Leadership Academy has its own website. So you can still, if you just type in Leadership Academy, you know, England, um, it will come up and you'll, you'll hit a website. And you can, um, you can, there's two ways you can do it. You can look at the programmatic offers we have for anyone. Um, and I have to say that a lot of our offers, our bite-sized learning and our free learning can be um, accessed anywhere across the world. Um, so that's one of our kind of st inclusive strategies to share good healthcare leadership. Um, but you can also access specific offers through your regional academy. So say if you were based in the Southeast, you'd go to the Southeast Leadership Academy landing page and you can have a look what offers there but but yes just have a little browse on the website and if it's leadership programs you're after you look at our programmatic content but actually there's blogs there's there's podcasts there's bite-sized learning there's a real mixed bag if you're just interested in exploring what leadership means to you. Now Rachel you just you don't just talk the talk I want to ask you about your leadership roles, because one of the very interesting aspects of your career is that you were president of the British Thoracic Society. Now, that's really tell us about that. That's really quite innovative and exciting. Oh, honestly, that is such the British Thoracic Society. I hold quite dear to my heart. And um, for respiratory clinicians, um, you know, regardless of your professional background, whether you're a doctor, a nurse, a scientist, a pharmacist, um, it really is a society that helps not only to educate, but, but, but provide standards of care um, for people living with respiratory disease. And it really is like a very small, close knit family. And we're always trying to extend our membership. But being, I was actually the first president from a non-medical background. So for the 40 years, um, all of the presidents had been um, doctors professors very esteemed academic clinical leaders so um to kind of being given the role um was a, a monumental occasion for me but also really just showcasing that the whole of the mdt should have these types of leadership opportunities so yeah i feel very grateful now you weren't just given the role that's a role you <laughs> earn so tell me how you got to be the president because that's a pretty prestigious post yeah, so I think it's just, you know, I I pay credit, a lot of credit to the amazing doctors I've worked with in my career as a non-medical consultant. You know, I work with it, a very specific, divine, defined scope of practice. And actually, I wouldn't be where I was today if it wasn't for the doctors that were championing me. And it was the same with the British Thoracic Society. So a chap called Mike Davies 
kind of I was on a course doing a presentation and give us the tap on the shoulder and said you know you should do more within our society we need more physios we meet, need more non-doctors to come in um, you know we, we need different thoughts different perspectives and I just started off doing very little things helping on guideline groups and becoming part of policy teams and um, you know listening to how other people had developed their career and then when you get asked when you get involved in something or you get asked to do something and you do a good job people tend to come back and ask you to do it again um and you don't always get things right but it's about just having that learning narrative thinking okay that didn't quite go how I thought it would go how can I learn from that and actually kind of do a better job for next time so yeah start off small and then when the bigger asks come in it's not having that imposter syndrome or however we want to define it um you know it's it's about actually recognizing your strengths and the uniqueness that you have as someone different in that space because often you tend to go in those spaces thinking oh god I'm different from everyone you know I haven't I'm, I haven't got you know all these letters after my name or I'm not academically achieved you know huge amounts so it, it's it's kind of resetting your narrative to say this is what you can bring rather than what you can't. I like that idea of resetting your narrative because, you know, you're a real role model for allied health professions. How would you encourage your colleagues and other allied health professions to take on leadership roles? Yeah, I think um, I think especially over the last five years, we, you know, well, the allied health professionals combined are the third largest workforce behind doctors and nurses. And collectively, you know, we have a real strength in not only numbers, but our approach to things being a, just a little bit different. So for me, it's rather than letting your professional identity define you. It's about, again, changing your narrative and thinking, what can I bring into that space? So if there's an advert for a clinical expert or a clinical advisor in stroke, in musculoskeletal, in respiratory, cardiovascular, whatever it is, a lot of the times we'll just shut our mind off and think, oh, they want a doctor for that. Or they want a nurse specialist. But actually, we can often be experts in those fields too, just in a different way. Um, so I often say, think about the things that interest you. Think about where your skills and expertise lie. Think about what value you have in that area and then look for the opportunities that may present themselves. So looking for vacancies, looking for requests, looking for calls that come out. You know, if people, if there's a research team doing something, ask how you can be involved if you, if you know, if you, if you don't want to go down a PhD or an MSc route. So there's other ways you can get involved in research and audit. So all of these little avenues where people can develop leadership roles, because I think a lot of the time people think about just being a manager as being as getting leadership skills. But actually, there's so many different facets we can enter now um, and be part of that collaborative rather than doing things in my own silo. You mentioned belief in your own expertise, and that brings me on to another issue that came up, and that is the use of the word consultant. I think there was a little bit of controversy about that. For me, it's about the non-medical consultant roles I um, work alongside and I work in are very clearly defined by objectives in a scope. And um, I think that's really important. So some of the concerns I think are really, really valid from doctors. And I think if some of these opportunities are being taken away from doctors in training, I think that's wrong. Um, I think our doctors in training have so many more challenges now than we've ever had in our career that I think we need to be really clear on why these roles are needed. And they're not needed everywhere. But I think that add real benefit to some specialities, you know, stroke, trauma, respiratory. So my field. Um, but yes, it is, it's pr protecting the consultant status as well. And I think just being really clear. So I always say I would never just say I'm a consultant. I'm a consultant physiotherapist. It comes hand in hand. I have a clinical doctorate, but I never use that title in clinical practice ever um so you know I know people that do but personally I think it can be misleading and confusing and I personally wouldn't do that so yeah I think there's a lot of work to be done redefining but I think getting rid of them completely um I think would be a sad time in our profession as well 
Now you've painted a very positive picture of being a leader and leading the profession. But I also saw a quotation from you that said, being a leader is difficult and uncomfortable. Tell me about the flip side of leadership. I have had I have experienced the very best of NHS leadership in the very worst. The very best of NHS leadership is, you know, that feeling of belonging, feeling of being included, valued, um, appreciated for what you do in the in being very clear about your role and responsibility within a team. The the very the very worst of leadership are those kind of toxic traits and narratives I'm sure we all we all know about. Um I think for me the hardest part about being an inclusive leader has been challenging the own biases that i had within myself acknowledging the biases that i that i had in my life and constantly trying to understand and recognize those as i progress through my career and in my leadership career and I think part of that is being an ally and it's being zero tolerant to those types of prejudices, discrimination, racism, transphobia, ableism, whatever it is in a senior position. And actually not only just start knowing your own um, biases and privileges, but actually then calling out those that poor behaviour, that discriminatory behaviour that you see as a senior leader. So that that can be uncomfortable because often people don't ask for your opinion or don't ask for that. But it's important that we we have, you know, the, res the responsibility lies with us. And I've certainly over the past, ever since Black Lives Matter's movement, for example, I think we've seen a real shift in, in, um, in the acknowledgement of the discrimination and the systemic discrimination that exists within my health and care structures. And how we, especially as white and um, British born senior leaders, can help call that out and hopefully in our lifetimes eradicate the discrimination that exists. So that when I talk about the uncomfortableness, that that's probably it. But I sit in my very privileged position. So it might be a very small bit uncomfortable for me, but for the, the people who are facing this discrimination. It's, it can be very, very damaging to people. The issues of racism and equity and diversity and discrimination, they're often, those words are often used in a theoretical context. I read a description of your personal experience that really hit home to me. And that was when you described being on an interview committee. Do you want to tell us about that? I was in one of my first leadership positions. So for those that know banding, it was an 8A band. And I went from working in a hospital in Newcastle, a very big, huge major trauma centre, but it lacked real diversity. You know, everyone looked like me, sounded like me, acted like me. I'd had a very fortunate career progression, very typical step, step, step. You know, no barriers really in my way. And I went, I took up a leadership position at St. George's um, in Tooting, which was, is a very multicultural hospital and part of London. And, um, you know, I was managing people from all ethnicities, from, um, you know, um, people who were internationally educated and recruited. And I was interviewing for a post and the person I selected when I was telling they were successful it felt, you know, I, I, I got the response I, re I expected from them. And when I was telling the second choice candidate that they weren't successful, something felt inherently wrong. And I couldn't work out what it was. And after a long conversation with my mentor at the time, who was an amazing woman, she was a black female. Um, and that's important because the second candidate was ethnically diverse. So they weren't white. They weren't like me. They weren't British born. And it was my prejudices when I was interviewing about what I expected that person to have done in their career was the same as mine. And I judged them for not having that same career path as me. Before people reach a senior role, we need to have a measure of how inclusive people's behaviours and values are. So I think that's something we need to work on because it's a choice. It's a choice that people have to go on when they are have a when they are afforded the privileges of being white British born and um, for me I don't have a disability so yeah that that's what I that that was the interview comment
You spoke about something else that really intrigued me and brought the message home to me. You spoke about gender. Now, you spoke about it in a way that really made it real. You spoke about the fact that it's okay for a male to go and work away from home on a couple of nights a week. But actually, when a woman works away from home, people don't think that should be the case. Now, that's a sort of silent gender discrimination. I've been working away from home for, for nearly 12 years now. So I, I class myself as a weekend wife, if you like. So um, I'm, I'm away working Monday to Friday and then I um, I'm home at the weekend. And, um, you know, certainly 10 years ago when I started to do this or when I explored the, uh, the thought of, relocating to London for a job and the reason I'd done that was because of the lack of opportunities in the northeast but yeah and just the the kind of comments the microaggressions macroaggressions um you know the rumors um th that people the the assumptions people would make about why you'd want to do that for your career um were quite were quite um startling actually I, I didn't expect it to be so so commonly mentioned than what it was um but yes there's definitely there's definitely a gender stereotype there um and I think certainly think from uh I've got friends that do the same and they're obviously male and they don't in you know, have a you know you, you have a lot of um doctors and dentists in training as well um, that that are now experiencing the same type of gender stereotypes as well, I think. so. Finally, I'd like to ask you about a different aspect of your life, and that's your humanitarian work. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, so I have been a humanitarian aid worker for um, just over 20 years now, and I've had experience in the British military, so I've been deployed on operational deployments, um, such as like the Gulf War. Um, and ever since then, in 2004, really, um, I'd worked, done a little bit of work with the Red Cross beforehand. Um, I don't agree with war. I think war is a terrible thing. But there is something about helping people in the most distressful time in their life, being part of that medical team who can provide, you know, emergency or life sustaining support in, in conflict zones, in, in, in countries, war torn countries that I don't know. It's just something that I've been drawn to ever since. And the people that are in these countries, the innocent civilians are often the most humble, caring, compassionate people you will ever meet. So, um, so yes, I've, I've continued with humanitarian aid work. Um, in the last six months, I've returned from Ukraine. And I also work for a medical charity called Medical Aid for Palestinians. And I've been working for them for around seven, eight years now. Um, so yes, um, I, I highly recommend it to anyone who has interest. Um, it's a very rewarding voluntary part of my life that I hope I'll do for as long as I, I can. Thank you very much for sharing so much of your life, your leadership journey, your humanitarian uh, contribution to society. It's just been wonderful talking to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much.